So thankful to have this great seat up here where I hear the, the voices from behind and spurs me on. You may have noticed, you may have, that the songs that we sung this morning are directly related to the text that we were in last week and again this week, very missional in nature as we have a charge to keep, so to speak. We will see today that Epaphroditus certainly trusted and obeyed and um, walked by faith and not by sight. And so this, this afternoon, as we again turn our attention to Philippians, I'm very thankful for, um, for this opportunity to preach and certainly for the opportunity that we've already had to worship in song. So we'll be in Philippians chapter two, right at the end of the chapter. Philippians chapter two. You remember a week ago, we looked at Timothy's participation in Paul's gospel ministry. And today has us then looking to this second exemplar that Paul gives us in in his letter to the Philippians. This exemplar in Epaphroditus as he participates in Paul's gospel ministry together with the church in Philippi. Now, admittedly, when we're going through a letter such as the Philippians, such as all of Paul's letters, it seems like as we travel through each paragraph, we're just jumping from one mountaintop to another. This is a wonderful thing. We see, in, we see this in chapter two alone. First, he grants a, an exhortation towards unity, but then at the same time provides instruction, even imperative, that we are to conduct ourselves with humility. And humility is the by, means by which un, unity is, um, is fostered in the church. And then he moves on to humility's supreme example, that being of the Lord Jesus Christ in that rich Christological statement where we see Christ's humiliation and then that leading to his exaltation. We also read of the kenosis at that time. We see just after that comes a command to pursue sanctification, but not only that, then Paul also speaks towards God's sovereignty in that process, even as we continue to be sanctified. And then we see Paul's apostolic example. I made reference to this last week as he's conducting himself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And now we come to the end of chapter two. And admittedly, there may be some as they come to these final verses in chapter two, they might view this as maybe the more mundane part of the, of the letter. I would say not at all, not at all. And there's a reason why I would say that. And I'll provide that reason by way of submitting an exhortation to you. Whenever names are associated with the apostle Paul, there is much to be learned. In every name associated with the Apostle Paul, much to be learned on our behalf. Each name that's associated with the Apostle has helped to shape him in some way. God has used these people to impact, to influence the Apostle Paul, to serve him as we've already seen and we'll see again today. And there are even names that are associated with Apostle Paul who challenge him in his ministry. And we can learn from them as well. Each of them are very practical examples for us. Practical application then to follow. Now, Paul makes mention of some of the people in, that are serving alongside of him. And we see this in Philippians 3 verse 17. Let's just turn, there, turn your attention there for just a moment. 
where he writes, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. And there's the point that I've just made. He says, the pattern you have in us, not in me, but in us. And so even as they are working together, partnering to further the gospel, we are to look at the pattern of all of these people that come around Paul and serve together with him. And so there's much to be learned from, from us, as, as Paul writes. So we need to then ask ourselves, which one of these names am I most like? Which would I most like to be like? How do I measure up to a Timothy, an Epaphroditus? Or how do I not measure up to either one of those or others? Well, with some names, not much is said, right? There's not a lot of detail with some of the names that are included. And yet, in some of those same names where not much is said, it's in the tiniest details that there are profound takeaways for us. And so we need to pay attention. There are more than 115 names in the New Testament that are either connected or in contact in some way with the apostle. Achaikos in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 17. Agabus in Acts 11, 28, and then again in 21, 10. Alexander in Acts 19, 33, 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20. 2 Timothy 4, 14 and 15. There's 14 more under the letter A. Just, I'd ask your patience as I go through them. I won't, but you get the picture, right? There are a lot, and there's a lot of detail given in Scripture. And it's for a, a very specific purpose that we would take something away from that. Now, not all names, as I've already said, not all names associated with Paul include positive interaction with the apostle. And as I also said last week, theology dictates practice. And so that's what we see in these names, these associates who are in some way connected to Paul, good or bad, right? Their theology dictates their practice, dictates how they will interact with this beloved man of God. And so there's a warning for us, and I get granted this warning last week already. Each one of us will live out our theology practically, and yet not one of us will rise above our theology. So our view of God, high or otherwise, will really determine how we live life on a day-to-day -day basis. And last week, as we saw, we considered Timothy's, first of all, we considered his attitude. He was described as being of equal soul to the Apostle Paul. There's a principle there that I think, although I didn't make reference to it last week, could certainly be said. We see this principle expressed by our Lord Jesus in Matthew 10 and verse 24, where he says... It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master, not above his teacher, but like his teacher. And that's what we see with Timothy. He's becoming like his spiritual father, Paul, even as Paul is imitating Christ. And so we've got an example there to, to imitate. We saw how Timothy's spiritual DNA matched Paul's. And God used Paul's gospel ministry to bring about Timothy's salvation. We saw that as well. Timothy possessed and demonstrated a Christ-like humility as he served Paul. He submitted to Paul in service and ministry. And he did so even while he continued to be developed, further developed as a leader in the church. And so we know that Paul served to mentor him, and Timothy continued to grow into the leader that he was in the church. Yet, Timothy also faced affliction as he partnered with Paul. He suffered 
for the sake of the gospel in the same way that Paul suffered. Often being alongside him, either being eyewitness or even um, finding himself a participant in that same suffering. And yet he didn't lose his ambition. He was always readying himself, being available to go and to serve wherever the Apostle Paul would need him. And our time with Timothy went so well last week and those charges that I gave throughout that message went so well that all of our ministry positions have now been filled at Grace Life. Did you know that? No, no, not quite. I said that one earlier today. It didn't go over very well. But people were puzzled. Really? No. No, but there was certainly a number of challenges that were presented. And I would say that there will be a number of challenges presented again, because we need to look at these, these names. And we need to really weigh our own character, our own ability, according to what we learned from these men that Paul was surrounded by. And so, just to clarify, Grace Life is still in need of ministry partners, okay? And that will be an ongoing, continual need. Timothy was the pastoral example. I said this last week as well. Now, there are few pastors, I would say, sitting among us currently. I would say this, most of you will identify more with Epaphroditus, because he is a layman from the church. He is a faithful laborer in the church. And so when I said last week that the rubber was going to meet the road, what I really meant was for most of you this week, the rubber will meet the road, okay? And so let's place Epaphroditus under the magnifying glass, if you will. Let's read Chapter 2, verses 25 through to the end of the chapter. Beginning in verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. This is God's word. Now, last week, I gave a very similar proposition. I would say that these final six verses of chapter two in them, Paul sets forth the example of Epaphroditus, another exemplary slave of Christ Jesus, so that you may evaluate the authenticity of your participation in the gospel. Epaphroditus, who clearly demonstrates slave-like submission to Christ, is given to us by Paul here so that each one of you would evaluate the authenticity of your own participation in the gospel. And I'll follow a very similar outline as last week. So first we'll take a look at the attitude shown by Epaphroditus in his participation. We'll see that in verse 25, followed by the affliction that attends participation. We'll see this in verses 26 and 27. And then we'll consider the ambition of Epaphroditus's participation, verse 28, but I've tacked on an additional part to this outline where we see the appreciation that is to be given for participation in gospel ministry. And we'll see this in verses 29 and 30. So first let's consider Epaphroditus' attitude. And we see this in verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my brother, 
my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Paul here continues to administrate over certain matters in the church in Philippi. He recognizes needs, and so he knows that returning Epaphroditus uh, will address these pressing needs that he is sensing. And I say pressing because Paul indicates that this is a necessary measure. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. But who is this? Who is this one who will be sent? Who is Epaphroditus? Well, we only read of him twice. And both times here in this letter, this epistle that Paul sends to Philippi. We see his name mentioned here in verse 25 and then again in chapter 4 and verse 18. And from there, we really have to just uh, dig into the clues, even from his name. His name is one derived from Aphrodite, the goddess of love in the, Greek, um, in the Greek religion. And Epaphroditus, which is derived from that goddess's uh, name, means honored or favored by Aphrodite. Okay? And so there's some clues there. This is a common name. Common name in the Greek world, common name in the Roman world. And so Epaphroditus was likely the product of Greek culture in Philippi, surrounded by it, grown up in it. His name may even indicate that his family was devoted to the worship of Aphrodite because they have given him the name that they gave him. And if this is the case, and I believe it is, then Epaphroditus is a Gentile convert to Christianity. He's a convert. Well, let's consider Paul. Who's Paul? Paul, on the other hand, described himself this way, and we see this actually in chapter 3, and we'll go over this next Sunday. But one of the things that Paul says about himself is he, he describes himself this way. He says, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to the law, a Pharisee. This is how he had formerly viewed himself. Well, Edward Loss, who is a theologian, a professor, wrote this about the Pharisees. He writes, From the people who neither knew nor followed the law, the Pharisees separated themselves. In fact, they avoided contact with them. They dissociated with tax collectors and sinners. They conducted themselves piously while highly esteeming traditions Tax collectors in the mind of the Pharisee were beyond repentance as they couldn't possibly know all whom they had defrauded. And therefore, there was no way in the Pharisaical order of things to make restitution for these, this fraud. So we've got Epaphroditus, the Gentile convert. We've got, we've got Paul the Jewish convert, if we compare these two men's backgrounds, we we would say that they're diametrically opposed to one another, would we not? But let's note this, they're no longer diametrically opposed to one another. In fact, Paul refers to Epaphroditus as my brother. Both have become converts. Both are Christ followers. And this in a world where there was still much division. We just have to acknowledge that Christ is building his church from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation. And we could even say that no one unites people who have nothing in common like Christ does. And no one knits the hearts of sinners together more quickly than Christ. And so we see Paul use this term of endearment, brother. They're of the same community. They belong to Christ. And he says as much. My brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Well, first he describes Epaphroditus, 
in ways that relate directly to him, himself, Paul. And then he also describes Epaphroditus as he relates to the church in Philippi. Fellow worker, synergon is the term that he uses in the Greek. This is where we get the term synergy in the English language, synergy. And synergy, just to take a very, um, uh, very generic type of, of definition for it, means that there's a cooperation of two or more agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. I would say that's exactly, that's exactly what Paul is describing here. You see, Epaphroditus working in concert with Paul in Rome, even as he's imprisoned, is actually multiplying to the ministry that is going on there. The two are better than one. And yet we'd have to say this, that although it's a combined effort, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily equal. Paul would still be authoritatively and recognizably um, higher, perhaps, than if we want to just view him that way. He's got a greater authority in the church. But Epaphroditus is certainly in Paul's inner circle. And he's serving and assisting Paul daily. He's co-laboring. And this has resulted in the cause of Christ being furthered to a much greater degree, even as Paul continues in chains. He's helping Paul's ministry. There are many fellow workers described in Paul's letters. He lists many, many of them. Prissa and Aquila, this was a husband and wife team who were tent makers, just like Paul. They no doubt helped to finance his ministry, even traveled to Ephesus together with him to support him, to be an encouragement to him. In Thessalonica, we learn that Jason was also a fellow worker. He hosted Paul and Silas, you'll recall, in Acts 16 and 17. And ultimately, Jason was dragged out before the authorities for aiding these two men. Fellow workers in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verses 2 and 3 are described this way. They serve to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so as not to be shaken by afflictions. And so very purposeful, um, very purposeful task of being a fellow worker. Justice in Colossians 4 and verse 11 is said to have encouraged Paul as he was a fellow worker. And in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 4 through 9, we see that fellow workers are those who are described as working in the fields evangelistically, where one is planting and another is watering, effectively multiplying ministry output. And so Epaphroditus is a brother, but he's also a fellow worker. And we get a sense of the character of the man, even as we consider these these labels. Then he's also a fellow soldier. This is a military term, a comrade in arms. And no doubt, he refers to Epaphroditus as a fellow soldier as a result of the report that he's received from Epaphroditus that has resulted in a response necessary by way of the letter that we're in. So certainly he has described to Paul something that is going on that has required him to, um, to be a comrade in arms. Paul writes in chapter three and verse two, he says, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. So let's understand that what Epaphroditus has come to report and what Paul for us is pointing out is this is a wartime effort. This is the way they see it. And we know this also from Another of Paul's letters, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, where he writes, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is a, this is a spiritual warfare that does not abate. 
And so we could say, even from just considering fellow soldier, we could consider, we could say that Christianity is a life of military service. Each one of you is in a life. You've committed to a life of military service. And this requires us, just as Epaphroditus was fighting, standing shoulder to shoulder with Paul in this effort, it requires the same of us. Epaphroditus has no doubt faced conflict. And yet, in being called a fellow soldier, he's shown himself to be proven trustworthy, capable of meeting that challenge and facing conflict. And so he's Paul's brother. He's his fellow worker. He's his fellow soldier. And in affixing these labels, Paul both affirms and honors this faithful participation of the layman that Philippi sent to Paul. And I think that Philippi already knows this, right? They know this about the man, or they wouldn't have sent him in the first place. But they also, or Paul also goes on to say that he is their messenger and minister to Paul's need. He is your messenger, Philippi. He is your minister to my need. Now, messenger here, apostolon, that's where we get the word apostle from. This indicates that Epaphroditus is simply one who has been sent by the church. He doesn't have the apostolic credentials that Paul has, but Paul is still using this term just to, just to describe a mission that the church has sent him on. And so he is a messenger. He is an envoy. He's been delegated to this task, delegated to carry a gift of money 800 miles in over 40 days to keep that safe and to deliver that into Paul's hands. And not only that, but also to deliver an update from Philippi. I'm sure Paul had many questions and I'm sure that Epaphroditus had much to say regarding what was currently occurring in Philippi in the life of the church. And no doubt, while Epaphroditus was with Paul. He likely consulted him on various matters, some maybe not even in the text of, of this letter, but he likely would have talked at length about personal things and other things and brought that back by way of encouragement to the church as well. And so the letter that we have before us is really the result of Epaphroditus being sent to Paul and now he'll be given it to be carried back to Philippi to respond to some of the things that he has talked about. This is Paul's response then to this messenger's report. And I should say that Paul's reference to Epaphroditus as an apostle shouldn't crush our cessationist view either, okay? That's not what, uh, that's not what he, he's not referring to Epaphroditus in the same apostolic sense as he himself is. Rather, let's just understand simply that he refers to him as an apostle because he has simply been sent by the church. And Epaphroditus was sent to serve Paul while under house arrest, not only to serve him, but then to minister to his needs. This is a a term that's used to describe priestly service that he uses here. And we see that, actually, we get a sense of that in chapter 4 and verse 18. If you just turn over there, Paul writes this in chapter 4 and verse 18. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. There is that priestly service type of language, fragrant aroma, acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. This is how Epaphroditus is ministering, is serving uh, Paul, even as he brings what the church had supplied. And that is that second reference then to Epaphroditus' name there as well. So in doing this and in serving Paul as Paul's personal assistant while he is with him in in Rome, 
Paul is participating in, or I should say, Epaphroditus is participating in Paul's gospel ministry. And so I think we get a sense of the attitude then of the man. The character is one unified in love and affection together with Paul. He is in faithful teamwork, even while in the trenches. He is a willing envoy to both the church and to Paul, so he's serving on both ends. And he's a servant, certainly, of Paul's immediate needs, not only financial, but he will come alongside and encourage him greatly, no doubt, as he is imprisoned. One commentator writes this about Epaphroditus. He says, Epaphroditus had put on the mind of Christ, taking on the humble life of an unsung servant. I would say that that is his attitude. That is his heart. And so we've seen the attitude. Now let's take a look at the affliction that accompanies gospel participation. We see that Epaphroditus also went through a time of affliction. We see this in verses 26 and 27, if you train your eyes there. Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him. And not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. And so like Timothy, we see that the authenticity of Epaphroditus' character is one that has gone through a time of testing, even as it's described here. He participated together with Paul in gospel ministry and yet faced affliction. But this being a different form of affliction than Timothy's. Timothy's suffering came at the hands of others as he ministered alongside Paul. This is a physical health issue. Epaphroditus' health floundered as he carried out his ministry objectives. He suffered physically. And really, because of his physical suffering, then Paul gives us the two reasons why he's sending Epaphroditus back to Philippi. And even this provides a little more insight into the character of the man. You see, Epaphroditus yearned to see the brethren in Philippi. He had a longing for them, longing to see them. No doubt after having recovered from what he recovered from, I mean, likely you and I would also want to be on familiar soil back at home, so to speak, had we gone through something like that for comfort. So that's not surprising. But he goes on to give the second reason. That is that the fact that the news of his illness had reached Philippi troubled Epaphroditus greatly. This this word troubled is also used to describe Christ's troubled spirit in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to his crucifixion. So this is a deep, deep anxiety type of trouble that he's experiencing. There's an inner conflict that that he is, he is really battling with. And yet that inner conflict, that anxiousness, came from not wanting to burden the Philippians in any way with his own concerns. And so again, we see, we see a Christ-like attitude here. He's placing the interests of others ahead of even his own. He desires to travel back and show them, hey, I'm well, I've made it. The Lord has been kind to me. And he's concerned about their welfare. He doesn't want them to to lose sleep over him. So certainly we see in Epaphroditus' example both a man who is sympathetic and empathetic, right? Both things. And we can only speculate as to what Epaphroditus' illness was or when it occurred may have been on the journey to Rome over the course of 40 days that he became ill, arriving in Rome already ill, or maybe it happened upon arrival. Maybe he had been there for a time. We don't know. But the fact is that Epaphroditus nearly died from his illness, from his affliction, while serving as Philippi's messenger and minister. And let's not lose sight of this, because we live in a in an age where we've got modern medicine. And so, you know, we may even just gloss over this, but 
in this time that they're living in, they obviously don't have access to what we do today. And so it's likely that a whole host of illnesses could have brought them to the point of almost dying. What Paul is expressing here is that the prognosis was bleak in Paphroditus' life. And still, despite this, Paphroditus selflessly fulfilled his service to Paul amid this affliction. And we can draw another parallel here. We can draw a parallel to Christ. And I believe that that's what Paul is doing here. In verse 27, as he describes how Epaphroditus has served faithfully while sick to the point that resembled death. He walked alongside death. Paul didn't think that he was going to make it. And we know that earlier, Paul described Christ as being obedient to the point of death. And so there's a parallel here. There's a a humble submission, even to the point of death. We know for Christ, that ultimately occurred. We know for Epaphroditus, the Lord was merciful. And so he continues to minister to Paul's needs at the expense of his own health. But we have to ask ourselves, how, did, how was it that Epaphroditus survived? And how was it that Paul endured through this? Because this affected both men, not only one. Well, we see that. We see that God extended mercy to not only Epaphroditus, but Paul recognizes it was a mercy given to him as well. Let's not miss the importance of what Paul is saying here. Now, nothing is said about how Epaphroditus recovers, nor is anything said about how Paul endured. And so the spotlight is really on the mercy of God. That's what we have to focus on, not on the vessels of mercy, but on the mercy of God. This ought to humble us. You know, I consider my own ministry ambitions. And I have realized in the time that I have walked this earth as a, as a, Christian, as, as a Christian, as a Christ follower, that I have often had my own ministry ambitions. And I'm reminded, even as I consider how close Epaphroditus came to death, that although God can certainly use us, he doesn't need us to fulfill his will in this world. He doesn't need any of us. And yet we can be thankful that his mercies are made new each morning. I wonder how often How often do you think Paul and Epaphroditus, as they reflected back on the suffering of Epaphroditus and how he recovered and the mercy of God in that, I wonder how many times they found themselves praising God for his infinite love, for his grace, for his mercy, for his goodness, for his forgiveness toward both of them, for his truth, for his compassion for his faithfulness in their lives. This must have been a daily and ongoing occurrence, even as they reflected on this one hardship that he gave them mercy in, that he extended mercy to them in. And we see that Paul, with Paul, God's mercy spared him also from a compounded sorrow, right? He said, that he would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Well, we know that, you know, the death of a ministry partner certainly will bring about sorrow. But what is the sorrow that he already faced? Well, we we know how his ministry was described, even in Acts chapter 9, verse 16, where the Lord says about Paul, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. His ministry would be marked by a road of suffering. And Paul acknowledged this also himself to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, where he told them, and now behold, bound by the, by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, 
not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. And yet he knew that God always went before him and that nothing that he went through had not first been ordained for him to walk through by God. And so in the case of Epaphroditus, Paul was spared the sorrow of the loss of this dear ministry partner. Now, I could point this out as well, and maybe should. Paul didn't miraculously heal Epaphroditus. No, we see that this was the mercy of God that was at work to, to heal, to bring about healing. That doesn't mean that Paul was indifferent as an apostle. We know that signs and wonders are attributed to the apostles to verify their apostolic office and certainly to, to show that to the church in her infancy. But Paul wasn't indifferent Epaphroditus' death would have been a huge deal to him at that moment and certainly in the days and weeks to follow. No, God had mercy. That's what we need to take away from this. God was merciful and he showed mercy amid the affliction. He did not need Paul in any way or he did, would not use Paul in any way to heal. So we've seen the authenticity of Epaphroditus' participation in the gospel evidenced in two ways. First in his attitude and then in through his affliction. Now let's consider his ambition. And this will be brief because it's very similar to last week's with Timothy. We see this in verse 28 where Paul writes, therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. I think the way to assess Epaphroditus' ministry ambition would be thus. We look at the word therefore, and based on all that Paul has already described, and considering that Epaphroditus has traveled 800 miles and over 40 days in order to bring this gift and to remain with him and to serve him, even to the point where he almost died. And now he is ready to be sent back immediately. And so his ambition is to avail himself to serve the church in Philippi immediately. We know that he'll be sent before Timothy. Timothy will be sent, but not before things are resolved regarding the case surrounding Paul. In the meantime, Epaphroditus will go ahead. He'll return to his home church he will serve there and prepare them for Timothy's arrival, no doubt. And eventually, even the Apostle Paul, as he anticipates being back in Philippi as well. And so Epaphroditus is going to avail himself toward this end. And Paul says that his concern then is lessened, knowing that this man of ministry, this brother, this fellow worker, this fellow soldier will be returning. He'll be sending him back to Philippi. And so I would say his ambition is one of availability, one where he is ready, willing, and eager to return even as Paul sends him. And then finally, this final point, the appreciation that we see for gospel participation. And we see this in verses 29 and 30. Let's take a look. Paul writes, Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. This is really a commendation, a commendation of Epaphroditus' service to Paul. And now he wants them to extend a warm and hearty welcome as faithful servant when he arrives back to them. And yet, Paul gives them this by way of an imperative. This is commanded to them. Why would he command this? Why would he have to command a warm, hearty 
welcome, that they would receive him. Well, we know that Epaphroditus likely brought news of a strain in the harmony of the church in Philippi. We see this even with these two women who are named in chapter four. There's some strife. There's some disunity. And so he gives them this imperative that they need to receive him all, the whole church, receive him. And that they would receive him despite the pride, ambition, and likely the external pressures that are present there currently that could very well distract the church from receiving this messenger, this faithful messenger, as they ought to receive him. And so the command is to receive him then in the unity associated with Christ. Receive him in the unity associated with Christ. And the manner is given there as well that they would receive him in the unity associated with Christ in a joyful manner that's characteristic of that unity, right? Unity in Christ brings joy. But Paul doesn't only leave the the focus on Epaphroditus. No, he expands this command to include other men as well. He says, Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men, plural, like him in high regard. And so it's anyone who labors as had Epaphroditus. Regard these these faithful servants highly because of their character, because of their proven worth, because of the ambition that they have in their hearts for the sake of the work of Christ. These are servants who, they don't seek compliments. These are servants who seek converts, not compliments. And they are willing to selflessly expose their lives to dangers, even as Epaphroditus has shown. He's he's up for a potential hazard. It doesn't stop him. In fact, we see that where Paul describes him as risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Even while Paul remained in chains, the prophetess came to meet Paul's needs in the ways that the Philippians from a distance couldn't possibly. There was a gap there. There was a, a lack in the supply chain, and so Epaphroditus filled that, filled that gap. He made up for their inability to serve Paul, their deficiency as the NASB renders it. And so this is to Paul's advantage and at their expense. Now, just to consider a little further these these two men, Epaphroditus, his exemplary model of participation, and Timothy as well, his exemplary model, the question could be asked, how does your participation in the gospel ministry of grace life here, how does it measure up to either of these two men, either pastorally or as a layperson, as a a member of, of grace life? I can't help but think even reflecting upon the last couple of years and seeing how in a way, our, you know, our ministry outreach was hampered by restrictions. And, and yet we've come out of that, right? No doubt the Lord has added to our numbers, but we also need to go forth. We can't just have people come to us because of what they've heard. We need to go out. And we are. We are. You know, it's, it's time to participate in the gospel ministry of these faithful servants that we pray for week after week, right? We could start at close to home. We love and appreciate the church up in La Crete who was formed only, um, only a few years ago. The one on the island, their, their pastor who they've now brought on as pastor will be here next week Sunday so you can meet him 
There's a church in Innisfail that we played a part in. How can we serve these? How can we participate together with their gospel ministries? We have a wealth of, of ability here. We have a wealth of capability here. How can we come alongside these upstart churches? Brad and I, Pastor Brad and I have spoken at some length about coordinating some short-term ministries. It is looking more optimistic all the time for travel even um, overseas. We pray on a weekly basis for Hovig in Armenia, for Sean in, in the Philippines, for David in Madagascar, for Ricardo in Colombia. I have no doubt that each one of those men have their own needs and that we as a church could easily come alongside and help in some way, meet them where they're at, hold the rope for them, so to speak. But let's not only think about sending, let's think about how we receive people back then as well, right? So when people come back, we know that our pastor actually Two of our pastors will be going to Vancouver Island just a few weeks to, to, to go to a service there. How will we welcome them? How will we show them honor as they return from participating in other gospel ministries? How can we, how can we do that for anyone from Grace Life who would go out? So that is, that is our task. This is our challenge to go forth from here and to serve alongside other faithful men and women in the field. But I also think back to Timothy, the pastoral example. And there may very well be, even sitting here, those whom God has in mind a pastoral ministry for. And that it's maybe even time to pursue that. I would say the best way to go about that is to first have a conversation. Have a conversation with one of the elders. Talk to somebody about that. And, and through even a series of conversations, maybe that can be given clarity. That may very well be a few of you here. But for the vast majority, I would say that Epaphroditus, serving as he did, behind the scenes, not in public ministry necessarily, but behind the scenes with his sleeves rolled up to, to, to fulfill any ministry in the church requires a whole network of people. And so there's much to do. And there's much to be encouraged by, even as we've considered these two men. Pastor Adam and Pastor Rob, Pastor Brad as well, these men are pastoring here, but are also currently furthering their education by beginning seminary shortly. Brad already has some seminary experience. So they are, like Timothy's, in an ongoing process, preparing themselves further for pastoral ministry. Well, that's the application for today. I leave you again, as I did last week, I'll leave you with a quote to consider. This quote coming from a dear brother in Christ, Mike Riccardi. Your life is given to you so that you can lay it down in such a way that makes it plain to the world that Christ is more satisfying than all that life can offer and all that death can take. That's why life is given to you. And I concur. And this well-known hymn from the pen of Isaac Watts were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. That's what we see in Epaphroditus. That's what we see in Timothy. And that's what we need to see in each one of us. So would the Lord then continue to prepare us for all that lies ahead as we Go arm in arm together for the sake of the gospel of Christ. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for really what amounts to a challenging text as we
measure our lives up against the lives of these faithful servants, Timothy and Epaphroditus. We're grateful for the example that they set. Oh, Father, we desire to be in brotherhood with one another, co-laboring and and fighting even for the sake of the gospel, locked arm in arm, standing shoulder to shoulder. And yet, Father, we admit that we are in need of further preparation. And so help us, grant that to us, allow others to come around us to, to mentor us, or that we ourselves would pour our lives into the lives of others for the sake of furthering the gospel here and around the world. Oh, Father, we pray for this church. We pray that we would be missions-minded, that we would go and serve faithfully where the needs are, that you would help us to supply for those needs, to fill the gaps. And Father, as we do so, we pray that you would be honored, in fact, glorified in all that we do. In Christ's name. Amen.